And Here we morning. are. Good morning to all our friends on Clubhouse. Good morning to everybody. Now I'm unmuting myself on Clubhouse as well. And we start with the clip that Richard Berger created for us. I so, can't wait. Yes, we go. Here we go with the clip. Uh oh. <laughs> no, no, adds to stream. And here we go with it. Every day is exciting for you, man. Well, once again, good morning, Timothy. I love that dance. Really, yes. really great. Yes, a, a wonderful warm up. And now we are on Clubhouse too, on LinkedIn as well. So uh, good morning, everybody, once again, and thank you for joining us. There is a lot to talk about today and we are short of time. So we have to finish at 9.30 and we'll try to keep it as brief as possible. But it doesn't mean that we're not going to have questions. We're going to, to have questions and observations shared on Clubhouse later. Stay with us and join us if you want to talk directly with Timothy and maybe me, I don't know. However, Timothy, without any further ado, so let's start. Thank you very much, Maya. Today is September 11th, 9-11, mm -hmm. right? 9-11. Uh, a is. day in, that we need to remember in history. Uh, this is our 84th episode, Maya, consistently, consecutively, Every Sunday, bringing you know an update on Japanese politics to mm. everyone in the audience. Our audience is growing. Thank you very much, everybody, for for tuning in, for listening, for telling your friends that there's a place where people can learn about what's going on in Japanese politics. Because as far as I know, uh, nobody else in the world is doing this in English to uh, to talk about what's going on of uh, of importance in politics, geopolitics with regard to Japan. So I'd like to get right into it. Like Maya said, we have a bit of an abbreviated session today. Um, I have obligations in the afternoon. Maya's tied up um, as well. So we'll try and wrap this up quickly, get quickly into our, our Q&A. We always have a Q&A for those of you who are on um, LinkedIn. Uh, the visuals are just on LinkedIn during the briefing, and then we go into the Q&A. And the title of this, this program is called uh, Japanese Politics One-on-One, -on -One, so that you individually in the audience can interact with uh, both Maya and I, who um, who are involved in Japanese politics, who who follow it very closely, and can respond and explain some of the things that maybe seem a little bit difficult to grasp, or or just to understand what the process is that we're currently in and what it means. So uh, please uh, weigh in if you feel like um, you know sending Maya a, a text question or coming up on this the. Um, uh, the audience platform in Clubhouse. But without, um, you know, wasting any more of your time, let's get right into it. So there are a couple of things that, you know, it's just been a very, very active week. Um, there are about six things I want to talk about. I want to talk about Mr. Kishida and his standing, his approval, what, you know, he, he had appeared in the diet hearings just this last week to explain what he's doing with um, COVID, he, uh, what is the story with the Unification Church, and um, uh, um, what he's going to do with the Abbe funeral. Why is Abbe funeral um, a state-sponsored event rather than just something that is being run uh, by the political party from where uh, Mr. Abe came? Uh, the yen continues to slide. It is pre presenting the Japanese government a, uh, an incredible and deepening uh, uh, potential crisis. Um, Japan is the outlier, as you know. Uh, the Senkaku Islands are always a, a kind of a a point of friction between China and the United um, and Japan, and also it's it's kind of a flashpoint. Uh, it is claimed by both countries, and um, nobody is really occupying it. Nobody is living on those islands, um, and whenever there are fishing fleets around there, it does cause uh, great concern. It is in the news these days, and that's a signal that it's it's going to be coming up more in in the very near future. So. We'll keep an eye on that. Today is the elections for the governor of Okinawa. We've been following that. Today is the election for um, the re-election for Denny Tamaki, who is uh, the incumbent. Um, he is being faced by two other challengers. I'll talk a little bit about that. Tourists 
are now coming in to Japan. They have a, a new rubric under which they're following. Similarly, there's a, a different rubric with regard to dealing with COVID. Those two are, are somewhat linked, as is the economy linked to tourism. So talk a little bit about that. There is a, an awful lot of action and uh, energy being put into um, the geopolitics between Japan, the United States, and many of the countries that are in this region, the, the Pacific nations, the Pacific Island nations, uh, Korea in particular, India, there's a lot going on. There was a two-day confab in San Francisco this last week. 22 nations sent, it, it, it's an outgrowth of the 2.2 2 plus 2. If you remember, the defense minister and the economic minister joined with um, you know several countries. They started it with Japan and the United States, Japan and Korea, Japan and India. It kind of resembled the Quad or an outgrowth of the Quad. It's different from the Quad. Um, and that seems to be taking on a little bit more steam. So there was a big confab in San Francisco um, or in LA this last week. Um, 22 countries attended and it was uh, the two, point, 2 plus 2. So attended by um, the defense ministers and the uh, ministers of, of economy, um, two days. And so you're going to see you know, this is a big deal. Not It's being motored by the United States, so it's under the Biden administration. There is a lot of energy being put onto that. And I think they need uh, quick payouts. We've got the, um, the, the uh, uh, elections going on in the United States in less than two months uh, for midterm elections. Uh, there's a huge fight going on there. You've been following what's been going on with uh, former President Trump and uh, the uh, FBI and the um, the justice ministry in the United States. So there's a there's a huge fight going on there. It's all going to come to a climax at the midterms. But um, the the president of the United States wants to generate some some uh, remarkable and demonstrable um, progress that he's making geopolitically. Typically, a uh, um, a leader in any country can find um, good beneficial movements forward when they go externally, when they go uh, outside to do uh, internal uh, international politics. It usually is a watershed for generating recognition and appreciation internally. The internal product uh, politics are much more difficult. Kishida is funding that too. But when a, a prime minister or a president is in trouble, frequently they go externally. And I think that is one of the, uh, the issues here. Uh, Japan and Korea, Japan and India, Japan and um, its treatment of ODA. So they've actually changed a little bit of their strategy in handling ODA, and I'd like to touch on that. And then finally, <clears throat> sadly enough, um, the Queen of England uh, passed away on, on Friday, and that is generating a lot of concern. Um, it has impact here for a lot of reasons. Japan and England are very close, and financially, economically, uh, England uh, plays a very big role, uh, the city of London. And the relationship between the Kishida administration and the city of London, you might remember uh, when uh, Kishida became prime minister, he went to London, made a fantastic, um, very broad speech, including, you know, economic um, exchange and, and the, the pegging of the yen. So um, we expect, you know, a lot of things going on there. The emperor will more likely than not uh, attend that funeral. More details on that coming up. First of all, let's get to Mr. Kishida. His approval rating is continuing to fall. This is quite rare for a Japanese uh, prime minister to be elected, to shuffle his cabinet in the dream, in the uh, expectation that his approval rating will go up. Unfortunately for uh, the current prime minister, his approval rating has gone down. So his uh, approval rating is, is inching down. It was 51% the last time the poll was taken at the beginning of August. Uh, the poll now puts him at about 50% approval, but the numbers for disapproval, the people who say that they don't approve of what he's doing, what the cabinet is doing, has shifted up to about 44%. Uh, in some um, instances, it's as high as 48% disapproval rating. So that one is, is um, a traject the trajectory of disapproval is, is increasing. And that has a lot to do with the LDP and the Unification Church and the Abe funeral. These are huge issues. They're occupying a lot of time uh, within the diet. Um, there are two things that happened this last week. One was, uh, if 20% of the uh, parliament says we want to question the prime minister, 
uh, in open hearings, uh, the prime minister needs to accommodate that. That's written in the Constitution, Article 53. And they put together 20 percent and they insisted that the prime minister come to terms with uh, the questions uh, from the opposition. He did that this week. Um, but in anticipating that, he also put his um, uh, his chief of, of the LDP uh, to get all of the LDP members, all of the diet members to write a document and submit it on Wednesday of what their relationship was with the Unification Church. And they collected all these documents, they um, analyzed it, they made it a little bit public in anticipation for the prime minister going in front of the opposition parties. So a lot goes into that. I mean, that's not something that happens overnight, but it was pulled together very quickly. The prime minister appreciates that his um, approval rating depends on how clear and how um, convincing he, he is on explaining what the LDP was doing with the Unification Church, how much um, uh, they were involved, at what level, who particularly was involved. And then the second one was, what in the hell is this with the, uh, the state funeral for Mr. Abe? So initially I didn't think this was such a big deal when the uh, former prime minister was assassinated uh, almost two months ago. Um, but it has bloomed into a, a huge issue. Initially, the LDP said this is, you know, it's appropriate that the former prime minister, the longest serving prime minister, the, somebody who really um, put a stamp of, of recognition throughout the world about Japan and about uh, Japan's uh, leadership, because now they have a prime minister who has been in office for more than two years or three years. Typically before Mr. Abe, we were changing prime ministers every two years or so. Um, Mr. Abe um, stayed eight years and 11 months. That's a, a record for Japanese uh, prime ministers. And so the um, Mr. Kishida believed and projected that it's it's natural to have somebody who was assassinated in the, you know, in carrying out his duties during an election campaign um, to receive this kind of recognition. And by the way, it's only going to cost about two million uh, dollars. Um, so it's it's not that big a deal. And um, those numbers were uh, run to due diligence. They were run to ground. And it turns out that the costs actually are more than six times uh, more than that. Uh, it looks like they're about a um, $118 million now, um, including the security and the police and uh, the transportation of dignitaries and all of the things that go into a, a state funeral. They've got the Budokan, they've rented the Budokan, and some of the expenses related to that is what the um, LDP announced. That's what um, Mr. Kishida talked about, just renting and, and facilitating that state funeral. And that's just a small portion of the overall cost that the government is going to um, have to pay. Some of that, whether um, the LDP pays for the funeral or not, the state has to provide security. They have to provide security and um, accommodations, um, facilitation for the many people. 190 countries will be coming to uh, this funeral at the Budokan on September 27th. That's this month. Uh, so it's a very big deal. And a lot of that money will actually have to come out of the state in any event. So there's uh, there's kind of dodging the question that it's going to cost, you know, 250 uh, million uh, yen. And that's the end of the story. So um, he had to go and explain that. It's it's not very convincing. Um, if you've been following the news, the number of people gathered, they first had uh, several large uh, demonstrations about the Abe funeral. And now that has shifted and moved towards the prime minister's office. And on a daily basis, there are people that are growing in number, uh, protesting the um, the Kishida administration, um, endorsing the state sponsorship of Mr. Abe's funeral. So um, it looks like those numbers are increasingly uh, against Mr. Abe. I don't know how he gets out of this nicely. He's already said it, it's going to be a state funeral. It's hard to back off from that. There was a period of time when he could have said the LDP will take care of that. The LDP will take care of the 250 million yen for the Budokan rental and that sort of thing. But I think we've, we've passed that. He just has to take the hit and it's not going to be um, easy for him, uh, particularly because other things are going on that really are damaging 
uh, him and his administration. Uh, the second thing that um, he was quizzed on in the Diet hearings on uh, at, at the end of this week were the Unification Church. So I told you that he had um, um, conscripted the LDP uh, Secretary General um, to uh, Mr. Motegi to get all of the LDP members to provide a sheet of paper that explained specifically their relationship with the Unification Church. And then they disclosed this information. And here's here's what they found, and it's it's not altogether good, um, but they went through some some defensive uh, maneuvers as well to to prevent that. But it looks like um, uh, of the 379 LDP members of both houses of the Diet, 379 members, 112 had some form of a relationship, and it and it, it's beyond just a regular kind of uh, meeting with them or having them come to your, your campaign speeches. It's a little bit more than that. It's like providing um, supporters, uh, volunteers for your campaigns, uh, providing um, maybe political donations or hosting you for a speech, that sort of thing. So it is at a, a level of, of concern, of involvement. And that's 112 LDP members and the um, prime minister has said, um, and uh, very strongly, in fact, that unless you break your ties, you sever your ties with the, the Moonies, the Unification Church, you must resign from the LDP. And there are um, 112 that are doing that now. Uh, there are two in particular that really um, owe their position in the diet to the support that they received from the Unification Church. So these two are particularly a little bit at risk. Um, let's see what happens to them. But I think they've got to make a choice, either resign from the LDP or um, uh, uh, sever the ties with the, the church that helped you get elected. Um, similarly, the LDP has a coalition with Cometo, which is a, the government arm, the, the lobbying arm, the, the uh, political arm of Sokagakkai. And um, the LDP should be, as a coalition partner, supporting uh, Komeito, and they are in a coalition government. But when it becomes revealed that many of the LDP members who have been receiving the benefit of having this coalition and supporting Komeito as a coalition partner are actually receiving benefits and, you know, scratching the back of their arch enemy, uh, the, the Unification Church, this is, uh, this is beyond acceptable. So... There are about 29 members of the Diet currently who owe their Diet seats to the fact that Komeito has been supporting them and endorsing them as a candidate. So if an election were to occur today and Komeito pulled out their support, about 29 of these members of the Diet would, um, would be highly at risk. They needed the Komeito support, their coalition partners' support, the vote of the coalition partners' um, members to kind of hold their nose and vote for the LDP candidate because the LDP was supporting the Komeito candidate in another election district. This seemed to work uh, to some degree, but 29 of these uh, members of the Diet will be um, severely at risk because they not only received the benefit of the Komeito votes, but they were also scratching the back of the Unification Church. So it's it's pretty complicated. I hope I've explained it in in enough um, detail that it's it's understandable and that you understand what the impact is. You remember two months ago um, when Mr. Kishida finished the uh, the election of the upper house, people were saying, you know, now he's he's got three years where he is going to be prime minister. There's no election for the, uh, the lower house. There's no election for the upper house that's scheduled. That's three years of kind of a honeymoon, a vacation that uh, the prime minister is going to have. And in less than two months, his political fortunes have plummeted. So in, in politics in general, not just Japanese politics, uh, the fates are very um, fickle. And we're seeing that happen right now with um, the current prime minister. He's somewhat um, uh, painted with the brush of, you know, play it safe prime minister. He's not really making uh, dramatic decisions. He's kind of sitting on the fence watching things kind of evolve, the, the Japanese government reaction, the Bank of Japan reaction to the, uh, the weakening of the yen is one such instance. Um, so there are other things that are going on where the prime minister hasn't really taken a bold stand. He's made a couple of, of moves politically that show that he is getting um, 
really terrific political advice. Uh, the LDP, they are, you know, well advising him on how to play this game. Um, so he is, um, on, on, a, on a political level, he seems to be holding his own in certain instances. But um, dramatically over the, the broad course of running the government and, and uh, finessing um, the economy, he's really uh, scored pretty low. They're waiting for the economy to take up. They're hoping and praying. He's pushed for wages to go up. They, they came up maybe 31 yen uh, in our report last week uh, overall. Um, that's not really keeping up with the inflation, which has exceeded 3%. And it looks like it's going to get um, much worse before it gets better. Japan is going to continue to keep their um, uh, tight money policy. They're not going to move, even though members of the G20 um, are all uh, refining uh, their uh, um, currency fluctuations based on what the U.S. Fed is doing. And it looks like the Fed will um, um, increase the, uh, the value of the U.S. dollar yet again um, next month, maybe this month, by another um, 0.7%. And that is a pattern that has been um, worryingly going on because the United States is, is suffering tremendously from uh, inflation, as we all know, we hear about. And with the midterms coming up, the, um, the Biden administration has to pull a rabbit out of the hat and project that the US economy is strong, that uh, exports are strong. Um, in fact, exports are strong because of the, the dollar, but for Japan, uh, the, the yen being weak, the, the economy is, is sinking internally where they're paying um, in yen for imported goods. Export-wise, they are um, making uh, cash on that, uh, the, the large companies are. Uh, and that's why I think the Japanese government is in favor of keeping the rates uh, low as they are now. I'm sorry, um, keeping them um, let, letting the, the yen uh, rate float because it does benefit uh, the amount of taxes that are generated and collected by the Japanese government for export sales. So um, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, the population is suffering, but the big companies are benefiting and the tax office is getting the revenue from that. So I think the, the general population is getting a little fed up with it. Um, the, the cost of goods has uh, increased and people are now demonstrably uh, showing uh, shelling out less money per month. In the last month of, of August, when the we're now getting the numbers uh, reported now, um, consumer spending by households uh, shrank uh, about three percent in that one month. So that's very dramatic. With the yen um, continuing to uh, to fall, it's it's very worrying for policymakers on how to keep the you know the people happy and employed and gainfully employed uh, and not sparking any kind of um, consumer revolt or a political revolt. But it, the combination is not very good with what's going on with, with China, with the defense policy, with Okinawa. There are just a lot of things, a lot of balls in the air. And it, it doesn't seem like the uh, prime minister is, I don't know, he doesn't have the constituency to be more bold and to take up uh, uh, risks to get the economy going. The, the number one issue, not only in, in the elections in Okinawa, so there will be a new governor uh, elected, you'll hear about it tonight on the news. Um, the, the main issue there is the economy. It is not the Henneco base relocation issue as it once was maybe two or three weeks ago. People have settled down and the Henneco and uh, Futema uh, base relocation has kind of fallen back to to number three, now people are worried about the economy and tourism. Tourism and economy are for a place like Okinawa, but also uh, Japan overall is a, is a pretty big engine of growth. So the two of those are tied together. Um, I suspect that uh, Denny Tamaki will be elected governor. He's running against the same fellow he ran against uh, four years ago. Um, uh, this fellow, his name is, what's his name? Sakuma? Um, Yes, Sakuma uh, Atsushi. Um, he is being backed by the LDP, uh, and his his pitch is: I'm going to increase the economy of of Okinawa. I'm going to make tourism uh, more popular and uh, make 
the central government send more money, more development money, more tourism money uh, to Okinawa so that we can flourish there. The central government has been holding that back because Mr. Tamaki, Governor Tamaki, is against that. And his main supporter is the Japanese Communist Party. So it, it looks a little bit weird. He was um, more LDP. He was a former LDP member, in fact, until he went to Okinawa and ran under um, uh, a kind of a more independent um, platform. So uh, he, his numbers look good, but it's it's not nip and tuck. I think he, he stands the advantage there. But if that happens, the probably the uh, base relocation will still be in a hiatus and the economy of, of Okinawa is still predicted to be kind of low. It is the um, lowest economy of all 47 prefectures, the highest uh, birth rate, the longest um, uh, longevity of anybody in Japan is um, enjoyed in Okinawa, but their economy is um, in the tank uh, comparatively. So uh, with the yen, today at 144 yen to the dollar. We talked about this last week, the kind of the flashpoint is 146 in, uh, I think it was 1998, um, the yen hit 146. And finally, after much uh, consternation and head scratching and sucking in air, they, they went in for intervention. Uh, we are approaching that and many people predict that before the year is out, it will broach that 146, that kind of psychological barrier, and then there will be intervention. There's been a lot of talk even this last week about um, the government intervening in the financial markets, but the trajectory and the amount um, that the government can actually do, the amount of money it has available to prop up the yen is um, um, determined to be uh, insignificant to really stop the course. They see that this this wall is moving forward and there's very little that they can do ab about it without you know, the Fed intervention as well. So it needs to be something that's done by the United States in, um, in cooperation with Japan. It looks like we are approaching that time. So maybe um, October, November, uh, you can expect some dramatic changes there. The elections uh, in the United States are also going to impact that. So it's something to keep a, a white, an, a, an eye out for. Uh, the European Central Bank also predicts that um, uh, the dollar will continue to strengthen. Um, in 2011, the yen was at 75 yen to the dollar. Um, that was as a consequence of the, the triple disaster, the earthquake, the nuclear, and the tsunami that happened then. And since that time, there was um, you know, just a, a restriction of exports going out because of, of that and the reduction of, of just work and labor that was going on and the amount of money that was required for reconstruction. But also Japanese companies were moving more aggressively overseas to keep production going in foreign countries, particularly in the Southeast Asia. And at the same time, we had Abenomics, which favored the large companies with this theory that it, it kind of theory that it's a trickle down that the big companies make more money and they will pay higher wages to their employees. That never happened. It didn't happen in, in 12 years. And the um, so we're kind of benefiting from that that legacy there. So the, the, the prime minister really needs to do something. New capitalism has um, been described and there have been some initiatives going there, but really something um, huge needs to happen so that um, uh, the economy comes back to life. I think that is the single biggest issue. It's the economy, stupid. Um, that the um, the prime minister faces um, the cabinet approval or disapproval. What's going on with um, the state funeral and how the current administration disengages from the unification church? I think these are issues that will come and go within the next month and a half, two months. But the economy is really going to be something that is something of a flashpoint, and we need to watch out for that because I I, I predict in. In maybe six weeks, there's going to be something rather dramatic happening there. Tourists are coming in now, as I've said. Um, the um, rate or the, the the cap of of tourists coming in has gone from twenty thousand to uh, fifty thousand uh, starting on Friday. Well, I'm sorry, on on Wednesday. And if you have three shots and you can show that you're not um, carrying uh, COVID infection, uh, you can come into the country. The interesting thing about that, unfortunately, is that you must buy your ticket through a Japanese-related uh, tour group. So it does increase the cost somewhat. 
for somebody who just wants to come and travel to Japan. But it is a kind of a self-appointed tour. You don't need to follow somebody with a flag and listen to their explanation and travel on the same bus and live in the or stay in the same hotels, eat the same food. It is a, um, a different uh, strategy. You can come on a self-appointed tour, but you need to come in uh, through a travel agent that's registered um, in Japan so that you have something like a sponsor. They know where you are. They know where you're staying. Um, and if you're coming and you're going to stay at your friend's house or you're just going to backpack around, apparently you're not getting preferential treatment here. You probably won't get your visa or the, the tickets to come in because they want it more managed. So they want to know where you're staying, uh, what your itinerary is, and that sort of thing. So for the backpackers and people who are trying to save a little bit of money and visit friends and just maybe climb Mount Fuji before the season ends, uh, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for them. And I imagine probably in two months we'll see a different change there. Uh, COVID is also uh, in the news. The um, new uh, bivariant, bivalent um, uh, inoculation, Japan has procured uh, 20 million shots of that. They actually haven't been approved for distribution um, by the health ministry. Um, that is coming up, but it's things are moving so rapidly, but the, the, United, the Japanese government has already purchased uh, 20 million from Moderna and um, from uh, Pfizer. So those will be uh, distributed before the end of this month. So things are moving at a very quick pace there. They will get approval, obviously since the Japanese government already purchased them. And it is supposed to be effective for the uh, Omicron variant. People 12 years old and older are um, qualified to receive that. And those distributions will be going out, like I said, at the, uh, the end of the month. Um, Maya, that's about it for right now. This is an abbreviated briefing today. Um, both you and I have something going on um, immediately after the, the close of the show. Next week is the beginning of Silver Week. Um, it's a five-day work week, and then we have a three-day uh, um, uh, three um, weekend. Uh, weekend of yes. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then it's a three-day work week because Friday is also a day off, and you've got Friday, Saturday, and Sunday off. That's called uh, Silver Week over here, so it's something to look forward to, and also it impacts a little bit on our briefing. So typically, if there's a there's some daylight, I'm usually out of town and um, hosting this uh, this briefing from some some far away place. So uh, I don't know what the plans are, what the wind is going to do uh, for us, but um, just to to key that up as an issue for people to keep in mind. Yes, I can sense your excitement about that. So very nice. Yes. Okay. So let's move to Clubhouse. Thank you very much for the briefing here on the live Thanks, stream Maya. and. The Thank you. I'll see you on the and other thank side. Thank you for then. everyone listening in. For those of you on uh, LinkedIn and Clubhouse, um, YouTube too, you know, YouTube. feature questions yes. so that we can address those. Thank and you very Twitter. much. And Twitter. Thank you. Okay. See you over there, Maya. <laughs> right. Thank you. See you.